AQA, A-level physics, astrophysics option, uh, video seven, and this is about Stefan's law and Wine's displacement law, Stefan's and Wine's laws. Uh, this chunk of the specification is what we're going to be looking at. So let's dive in. Now, a black body. If you did AQA GCSE, you should know what a black body is. Um, if you're not sure, I suggest you have a look at my GCSE video about this. But the definition of a, a perfect black body, it's an object which does not reflect radiation. It absorbs radiation and it emits radiation. If it's in thermal equilibrium, then the radiation it absorbs, the amount of radiation it absorbs and the amount of radiation it emits is the same. It stays at the same temperature, but it does not reflect radiation. A black body isn't necessarily black. In fact, a star, we can consider a star to be a black body. But anyway, that's the definition of a black body. It's a theoretical object which does not uh, reflect radiation. Now, this is the spectrum uh, of radiation emitted by a perfect black body. There's actually an equation for working out these curves. Now, notice what does the curve depend on? Well, the main thing is it depends on temperature. If you look at the 5000 Kelvin curve and compare that with the 4000 and the 3000 Kelvin curves, basically, the hotter the object is, the more radiation it emits. And the curve, the peak of the curve is at a shorter wavelength. If you look at the 3000 Kelvin one, uh, most of its radiation and an awful lot of it is infrared and other wavelengths. The 4000 one, there's an awful lot of visible. The 5000 one, there's a lot of visible and a significant amount of ultraviolet as well. OK, so the hotter it is, the more radiation that you get and also the peak is at a shorter wavelength. It's towards the ultraviolet when it gets hotter. Now, this is the spectrum of a particular star. And look at that, blimey, it looks a little bit like these curves we've just been doing. OK, and we can consider a star to be a black body. Sounds a bit strange, doesn't it? A black body, a star. Well, it is. OK, a black body isn't black necessarily. Uh, this is the spectrum of light emitted by a star. And you will notice it's the same kind of curve shape uh, and there is a peak. Now, there's a, a very useful relationship called Vine's displacement law. Um, in the syllabus, it actually says lambda peak times t equals a constant. It's the same equation. But basically, using this and using this Vines constant, we can work out the temperature of the star. If we know where the peak occurs on the graph, then we can work out the temperature of the star. We're talking the surface temperature, by the way. Uh, as you go deeper into the star, it obviously gets hotter and hotter. When you get to where nuclear fusion is happening, that's rather hot. We're talking the surface temperature of the star. So the peak for this star occurs at 430 nanometers. Calculate its temperature. Pause the video. Have a go yourself. The answer is that. So be familiar with this equation. It comes up very, very often using this equation. Vine's displacement law or Wine's displacement law. Now, there's another law that we need to know, and this is to work out the output power, which is basically the luminosity, the amount of energy emitted by our star every second, okay? Uh, and the power is P equals sigma A T to the four. Sigma is a constant. You'll be given the value of it. 
uh, a is the surface area now remember that the surface area of a sphere okay the surface area of a sphere you should know is 4 pi r squared okay the volume is 4 thirds pi r cubed the surface area is 4 pi r squared uh, and t is the temperature obviously the kelvin temperature now the syllabus actually says comparing the power output of stars not necessarily working them out although you may be asked to do that uh, but comparing the power output of stars the absolute magnitude as i said would be proportional to the power output um, two stars of the same spectral class two stars the same type of star in other words maybe two blue giants would have about the same temperature uh, and if one star has a larger absolute magnitude then that must mean that it has a larger surface area so it's probably a bit bigger comparing the power output on the next slide I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about look at this this is Orion uh, my favorite constellation all kinds of interesting things in Orion including Rigel which is a, a blue supergiant uh, and Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse if you like which is a red supergiant uh, look at the temperatures Rigel 11,000 Kelvin surface temperature uh, Betelgeuse 3,500 Kelvin Rigel is a lot hotter okay um, look at the radius of Rigel 55 million kilometers uh, Betelgeuse 617 million kilometers Betelgeuse is much much bigger has a much bigger surface area the absolute magnitudes uh, Rigel is a bit more luminous it's about an order of magnitude and a half more luminous than Betelgeuse uh, the apparent magnitudes and Rigel is brighter it's actually one of the brightest stars in the sky 0.15 uh, Betelgeuse 0.45 notice that both of those are less than one which means that Hipparchos had probably had a few Uzos when he'd worked out his scale compare the power output of these two stars in Orion you might be asked to work out various things you, you've got enough information to actually work out the power output of both of these stars what I did here is uh, I worked out I've got the radius I've got the surface area I worked out I've got the temperature I worked out the power output there's actually not much between them actually is there you know the uh, Rigel is about 0.8 times 10 to the 31 Betelgeuse is about 1 times 10 to the 31 not much difference between them uh, one interesting thing is I worked out the peak wavelength in the spectrum and you'll notice that for Rigel the peak is very very much ultraviolet uh, and for Betelgeuse the peak is very very much infrared uh, and that would explain magnitudes a bit more than the power output were would rather now uh, there's another law that we need to know the inverse square law now the light from a star uh, as it spreads out as it gets further and further away then it covers the same amount of energy covers a larger and larger area as it travels outward now assuming that none of this light is absorbed uh, and bear in mind you know uh, some of it will be absorbed if it's inside a, a galaxy or whatever there's all kinds of dust and rubbish in there which can absorb some of the light but assuming that no light is absorbed then the intensity uh, this is watts per meter squared the intensity will be proportional to one over the distance squared okay I proportional to one over X squared if you like and that's called an inverse square law uh, you will have met this with gamma radiation there's an inverse square law with distance as well you've met this before the inverse square law 
And it applies to the light from stars as well. Imagine you've got two stars, A and B, and they've got the same absolute magnitude. So maybe they've got the same luminosity. Now, if star A is twice as far away as star B, then its brightness will be a quarter. Because from the inverse square law, the, the brightness will be, or the luminosity, the amount of light we get will be, not the luminosity, I beg your pardon, how much light we get will be proportional to one over x squared, so it will be a quarter. Uh, and that means that the difference in apparent magnitude will be about uh, Pogson's ratio 2.51 to the quarter, which will be about 1.26. I say about because this apparent magnitude scale, as I said, is very, very subjective. But the inverse square law, that's what it is. You might be asked to use that as well. Let's have a look at this. Star A and star B both have an absolute magnitude of minus 6.7. Star A is 5,000 parsecs away. Star B is 2,500 parsecs away. In other words, star A is twice as far away. Calculate the apparent magnitude of each star. Well, we would predict that the amount of light that we get from A would be about a quarter of the amount of light that we get from B. OK, so uh, from what I worked out on the last slide, the difference in um, apparent magnitude should be about one and a half, something like that. So I've worked out the apparent magnitude of both stars using that equation. Notice that the difference isn't exactly 1.5 and I'm putting that down to the Hipparchos scale being very subjective.